Hike DMV. We have made it to another Sunday and I am so excited to be watching and worshiping with you all in today. I pray that you are staying safe and staying healthy during this time as we continue to adjust to this new season in our lives. I have just a couple of quick announcements to let you know what is going on throughout this week for Impact. And so today we are continuing with our current teaching series, The Doxology, and that will be taking place in just a couple of moments. So stay tuned as Dr. Lee brings us the word. We are excited about our Sunday school options. If you head over to impactdmv.church, you can find out more information regarding that. There are lessons available for kids as well as for adults, so there is something available for everybody. And on Wednesdays, we have prayer going on, so if you are available noon to 1 p.m. for noonday prayer or 7 to 8 p.m. for corporate prayer, we invite everybody to join in with us and come together in prayer on Wednesdays. Our high impact groups are still meeting Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. So that's also exciting and we encourage everybody to get connected and stay connected throughout the week with those. And if you would like more details, you can see those on the website as well. And our compelling conversations are still taking place Friday mornings at 8.30 a.m. with Dr. Lee. And you can see that via Facebook Live or WBGR's network and tune in for those. We are excited also about our birthdays that are coming up this week. We want to continue to celebrate them. And so happy birthday, May 5th to Nyera Hill Simmons. And we wish a happy birthday to Caitlin Rollins on May 8th. And happy birthday, May 9th to Salamutu Karoma. And those are all the birthdays that I have. So happy birthday to you all. And we also want to continue to be faithful in our giving. There are several options to give. If you would like to continue to mail in your envelopes, you can mail your offering to the church address, which you can also find on the website. We also have the option to cash app if you want to cash app dollar sign impact DMV church and you can give that way as well. There's a text to give option and there's an option on the website to give in the upper right hand corner there's a give button and you can utilize that as well. And those are all the announcements that I have for you guys. Like I said I hope you continue to stay safe and thank you so much for joining in and worshiping with us today. Thank you Lord for this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for another opportunity to come and worship your name. In these times, Lord, I ask that you will protect us and give us peace. Thank you for all of the essential workers and doctors. I ask that you will protect them and give them strength as they go out every day sacrificing their lives. And for us at home, I ask for peace and a sound mind as you work from home and continue to finish schoolwork from home. Give us the wisdom and understanding, Lord. Thank you for blessing us. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship this morning. We are so excited about Jesus, and we're so excited that you've decided to join us this morning in worship. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, we ask you to gather your family, gather your children together, amen. We want to worship the Lord together this morning, amen, as we rejoice over the Lord's faithfulness and his goodness toward us. Amen. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. That washes white as snow. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Oh, the blood. Oh, Blah! 
that was shed for me, O oh God. Hallelujah. Our hope is built on nothing less than your blood and righteousness, O oh God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. Than Jesus blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. But holy trust. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. My hope is filled. My hope is filled. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. I dare not trust the sweetest praise. But holy trust. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone.
prayer of confession. Father God, in the name of Jesus, this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you are God alone. You are holy, you are worthy, you are sovereign, you are faithful, and you are just plain good. Father, we confess, O oh God, our sins of omission and our sins of commission. Your word declares that we, we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us from unrighteousness, O oh God. Apply the blood of Jesus to our account. Fill us afresh with your spirit to overflowing, that we may be an influence to those around us for your name's sake, and for your glory, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, Impact DB. I'm Tyrone Watkins, and I just want to share with you this morning just a brief testimony. Um, I know we're going through this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which might be a little scary and shaky for some, but um, hopefully what I'm about to uh, share with you will give you uh, some encouragement. Now, I have what's called a underlying condition, heart disease. Uh, which started for me back in uh, 2015, um, having a heart attack and uh, pacemaker slash defibrillator, um, four stints, and then finally being diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Now, fast forward back to, or ahead to February of 2020. Okay, I go to the ER, I'm feeling sick because um, well, actually, I have, I've been tested positive for the flu. So I'm at the ER, they told me I have the flu and all this stuff. And then uh, in addition to that, my defibrillator has been going off two or three times. And so I have to make an appointment to see my doctor. And then a doctor gave me an appointment to go see the doctor that actually put the device in. So. This is late February, going into early March. I'm scheduled to go in the hospital for three days because I have to start taking this new medication and they want to see how it's going to react uh, with me taking it. Now, that didn't take place because we got full blown into the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I wasn't able to go into the hospital for that. Now, at my job, they're telling me, hey, you are an essential worker, so you have to come to work every day. So they give us this letter to carry around in case we get stopped by the police. We show them this letter, we are an essential worker. Everybody else working from home and, you know, I'm going to the job. Meanwhile, I have this underlying heart condition. And so I didn't want to right away tell that to my, my, my supervisor because I didn't want to Number one, kind of use that as a crutch, but then I didn't want them to use that against me uh, to terminate me or lay me off. So I'm going along, I'm going in the office every day, and then they're saying, oh, there's no way you work from home. But then, come to find out, hey, you guys can work from home two days a week. So then we're having, at my other site, 30 people that tested positive for the coronavirus. So now, guess what? Everybody can work from home five days a week. Every 
remember originally they said we're not able to work from home, but now we can go from two to five days from working home. So I say all that to say this: be encouraged, you know, when you put your faith in God and your trust in God and let God handle it for you. God will work it out for you. I was able to work from home. And this is going into my third week now. And I'm just so thankful and grateful to be working at home. And I also pray for, you know, my co-workers who are still coming in, some of those who are essential workers as well. But then also I pray for the 30 people that tested positive for the coronavirus. But I thank God, like I said before, that I'm able to stay at home and work. Um, I still have a job, able to, you know, pay bills, put food on the table. And so, in fact, DAV, Please stay encouraged, be encouraged, depend on God, trust in God, and let God work it out for you. Thank you. I'm Angelo Mitchell, and I'm here to read 1 Timothy 1, 12-17. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you, Father. Lord, we bless your name, Father. We thank you for being the thrice holy God, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and your grace that is extended to us every single day. A brand new mercy we see. Great is your faithfulness towards your people, Father. And we see it full well every single day, Father. Lord, I pray today, Lord, as we proclaim the truth of your gospel, Lord, that you would create in us, Lord, a heart of gratitude, Lord. Lord, that we would praise your name, exalt your name for your goodness and your kindness and your favor towards your people. Lord, you have been good to us, Lord, beyond measure, Lord. Lord, it is not because of our goodness that you've been good, Father. The opposite is true, Father. Your goodness is amplified, Father, because we see our brokenness, Lord. We see our weakness. We see our failures, Lord. So this morning, Lord, once again, Show us your favor, Father, through your word, through your kindness, and may that result in us being grateful and thankful and just having a spirit of gratitude for everything that comes our way, everything that we endure. And Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. It is so good to see you this morning in Pack D and V Church. And I want to get right to the text. There's a lot to talk about today. We're going to be coming this morning from 1 Timothy, the first chapter and the 17th verse. That's the doxology that we're going to kind of walk through of this morning. And I want to read that to you. 1 Timothy 1, 17. It says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invincible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to take some time and kind of read or talk through this chapter about what revelation is revealed in this text that results in Paul proclaiming that in a doxology. If you look at verses 1 through 11 here, uh, Paul is encouraging Timothy to remain there in Ephesus. There are false teachers there that are teaching a false gospel. These men are unfaithful to the gospel that Paul preached. And it seems to be some misunderstanding of the usage of the law. The law absolutely could be used to administer justice and also to reveal sin in our lives. But no one should be crying out for justice because justice demands that we die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to proclaim the gospel that he heard Paul himself preach, a gospel that proclaimed 
the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, be true to that gospel because none of us want justice. That's not what you want. You want the mercy and the grace of the sovereign God of the universe. So Paul shares with Timothy his own personal testimony to get this point across to Timothy, to make sure he understands the grace and the mercy of God and how they work together to produce worshipers, something that the law never could do. If you look at the 14th verse in that first chapter, it says this, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He's talking about the grace of God overflowing in him. Uh, but not only that, that overflow of God's grace produced in Paul an emotion that he never lost. And that is the emotion of gratitude, that sense of gratitude or gratefulness for God pouring out his grace upon him. That gratitude never left Paul. Look at the 12th verse, back up now. And it says, I thank God who has given me strength. He is overwhelmed with gratitude because it overflowed in him. Gratitude and grace belong to the same experience. Being brought into God's kindness produces in us gratitude because it was God's grace that allowed us to be who we are and what we are today. God glorifying grace is produced in us when we have a renewed vision of the grace of God in our lives. Paul here is talking about the grace of God overflowed for him. The NIV says that the grace of God was poured out upon him. When we recognize that it is God's grace that has kept you, that has sustained you, it should produce in us a gratitude for the sovereign God of the universe. And this gratitude seems to be one of the, the motivations of Paul's life. If you look at 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and i'm just going to read the first clause of the 14th verse it says for the love of christ controls me or compels me and i like what jb phillips says he says the love of christ leaves me no options oh my goodness i love that it leaves me no options when i consider god's goodness towards me it leaves me no options in terms of lifting my hands and saying thank you but not just that this is not uh, the courteous thank you that we extend to those uh, that may do us a, a solid or do us a favor or uh, enact some uh, act of kindness towards us. This is a thank you that comes from the soul, the deepest part of Paul. He's saying, God, I thank you. I realize, I see, Lord, your goodness towards me. And God, I am thankful for that. Free grace without merit and without human effort does not produce in us carelessness. We see that already uh, from the Apostle Paul's life. It does not create in us a carelessness about God, about his will, about his mission, about his word. It does not create in us carelessness. But what it does produce in us is a glorious obsession with pleasing him and with honoring God. Paul's gratitude for what God had done for him and through him was deepened by three things that I want to mention to you today. Uh, the number one thing that Paul says that deepened his gratitude for God or towards God is what he had become. Uh, if you look at that 12th verse, it says, I thank God who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Uh, he's saying here that God, you strengthened me, you energized me, you dynamized me would be a more literal translation of that word beyond my normal customary limits. You took me beyond what I was capable of doing on my own. Uh, and he said, you've considered me to be faithful. N not only am I a justified sinner, but you have considered me to be faithful and you have appointed me to be a servant and you have entrusted me with your most 
prized possession, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, your most precious gift to humanity. You have entrusted me with that. So how does Paul identify himself? He identifies himself in all of those that proclaim the gospel. He identifies them as servants. And I like what the Hallman Dictionary says how it defines what a servant is. It says, one who utilizes and manages all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation, of God's creation. And Paul is saying here that you have considered me faithful. You've considered me trustworthy with the treasure, with the gospel, your most prized possession to humanity. You have entrusted me. And Paul is overwhelmed by that. And he's saying that you have made me trustworthy by your grace. I want you to look at Ephesians, the first chapter in the sixth verse. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made me accepted in the beloved. Paul is overwhelmed when he considered what he has become by the grace of God, that you have made me acceptable in the beloved. He realizes I don't deserve this. This is way beyond my natural strength, my natural ability, but Lord, you have made me worthy in the beloved. The grace of God was the constant source of encouragement for the apostle Paul and throughout his ministry. If you look at Philippians, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, it says this, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. He said, I can do all things, but I can do those things through him who gives me strength. So what Paul does throughout all of his ministry, he takes no glory for any of the things that he is able to achieve. He says, I have done those things through Christ, he directs all the glory to the sovereign God of the universe. And this is constant throughout Paul's ministry. If you look at Galatians, the second chapter in the 20th verse, it says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this is the secret of everything of eternal value, the recognition that everything that I have, everything that I am, it is because of the grace of God. And we take no glory upon ourselves. We don't celebrate ourselves. We celebrate the goodness of God in all that he has graced us to accomplish, that you poured your grace upon us with abundance, that should be our mantra and that should stimulate or cause us to proclaim a doxology to the sovereign God of the universe. God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. I thank you, God. And this should be very encouraging, especially for those like myself who consider themselves to be the weakest among us. Um, you know, you, you feel unworthy. You feel like you don't have the proper set of giftings. Sometimes you look back or you look out and you see other people accomplishing great things, seem to be very smart, very gifted. And you see yourselves as, as not having any of those giftings. This should be encouraging to you because Paul is saying here, I'll usefulness to the sovereign God of the universe has nothing to do with our own ability, but has everything to do with the grace of God being poured out upon us. God taking us way beyond our natural and customary limits and giving us a power, a wisdom, ability beyond our natural ability. What you see me doing here is way outside my natural abilities. I am a musician. I'm very comfortable behind the organ and behind the piano, writing songs, being in, uh, producing mu music. That's my, that's my wheelhouse. So what you see me doing here is way beyond uh, my natural ability. In public speaking, if you would have told me 15 years ago that this is what I would be doing, I would have laughed in your face. This is not my strength. There are other people that can communicate a lot better than I can communicate. And I'm sure many of you all are saying amen to that right now. But this is what God has called me to. And when I consider that God, you have found me 
faithful, that you have found me trustworthy. And I'm trustworthy and I'm faithful because you've poured out your grace upon me and you've called me to be a servant. God, I give you all the glory. Uh, I can't take a vow when I preach a sermon and people are blessed by it because I know that it is the grace of God, the power of God, the strength of God, the wisdom of God that has come to me that has enabled me to say anything of eternal value. So be encouraged if you think you don't have what it takes. Actually, you ought to be grateful you don't have what it takes because that is the perfect scenario where you can receive the grace of God poured out on you and begin to walk in gratitude to for the level that you are experiencing the grace of God right now because where you are today is not where you're going to be tomorrow if you remain grateful if you remain humble the grace of God will abound upon you beyond anything you could imagine glory to God so number one Paul's gratitude was deepened by what he had become number two his gratitude was deepened by what he had previously done. Look at the 13th verse in 1 Timothy, the first chapter. And this is very encouraging, uh, especially for me. It says, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul said, that's what I was, and I acted ignorantly, but I love what he says, but I received mercy mercy. Now, what Paul is given here, he's giving a description of the reality that he trampled on both tables of the law. Uh, they believe that one of the tablets of the law were in relationship to God. The other tablet of the law was in relationship to humanity. So Paul is saying here, I trampled on both tables of the law. You guys want to talk about the law? Yeah, I messed up the law. Though I was a well-trained, devoted Jew, I trampled on both tables of the law. If you look here in this text, the first thing that Paul says here is that I was a blasphemer. And that's trampling on the first table of the law that was in relationship to the sovereign God of the universe. He says here that I was a blasphemer. So Paul, in stating here that he was a blasphemer, who did he blaspheme? Uh, because the question comes, who did, who did he blaspheme? Because we know that Paul was a well-trained, well-devoted, highly devoted Jew. So he most certainly did not blaspheme the first person in the Trinity, the Father. He didn't blaspheme the Father. He would have never done that. He was a devout Jew. So who did he blaspheme? Well, he blasphemed Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the reason why this is so important and that we take mention of this uh, is because this is one of the clearest indications of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Because you don't blaspheme a prophet, you don't blaspheme a good or ordinary man, you blaspheme God. So in Paul saying or identifying himself as a blasphemer, he's also attesting to the fact that Jesus Christ was divine, that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And then he goes on and he tramples on the second tablet because he speaks about how he persecuted the church the people of God. He trampled on both tablets of the law. Let me share with you. Look here in the book of Acts, Acts 26, uh, verses 9 through 11. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's blasphemy. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in, in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, murdering them. I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul said, they were running from me, and I tracked them down, and I still persecuted them. Paul said, man, I was against God, and I trampled on both tables of the law. So Paul is recognizing here 
what he had been. Let's look at the 15th and the 16th verse. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. I, Paul has already stated uh, that he was a blasphemer, a, a persecutor of the church, a violent man, the worst of sinners, but God showed him mercy. And, and I love the fact that Paul says here that I am a sinner. Some people are challenged with Paul identifying himself as a sinner. I absolutely am not. And the reason why I am not challenged by that because me, in my own strength, that's who I am. And that's what Paul is talking about him. He's given his testimony concerning who he was or who he is without the sovereign God of the universe in his life or before God poured out his grace upon him. And so now God has taken the filth of our lives. He's given us his righteousness and we stand complete in his righteousness. We don't stand in our own righteousness because in our own righteousness, this is who we are, not who we used to be. This is who we are. But we have been brought into the kindness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we stand complete in him. And Paul is saying, it is God's grace that I'm no longer these things. And because of God's grace upon me, I am so grateful. I hope you get that. That, that should be bubbling up from your belly when you think about who you used to be. I used to be a liar. I used to be a thief. I used to be a fornicator. I was a murderer. There are, are so many things I used to be, but thanks be to Jesus Christ that I am those things no longer, not because of my own righteousness, but because of the grace of God that has been poured down upon me and upon you. And that should re create in us just this overwhelming sense of gratitude. It deepened Paul's gratitude for the sovereign God of the universe for sure. And so I must declare here what my title is of this sermon. I'm sorry I didn't give it to you earlier, yeah? But grace and mercy prevails. Grace and mercy prevails. In the 13th, 14th, and the 16th verse, it gives us three things that Paul received from God by the grace of God that he was grateful for. One, God, he had received mercy. Number two, he received overflowing grace. And number three, we see in that 16th verse, he received perfect patience. I love reading the writers of old, Jonathan Edwards, uh, the, the great Puritan Prince, John Owens. I love reading their writings because there is this sense of wonder that I see in the Pauline epistles, this sense of wonder and gratitude for the grace and the mercy of God towards their life. All of them write about God's patience towards them, you know, and, and I can, I think about that uh, even as it relates to myself, God, do you ever get tired of me telling me the same thing over and over and over again? Do you ever get tired of me? And I love the fact that God has for me and he has for you this perfect or this complete patience. And there's nothing I bring to the equation. There's, there's nothing that I bring to the table. And I love this by Jonathan Edwards. Listen to what he says. He says, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. I contributed nothing to this, but I have received this grace and this mercy and this perfect patience from the sovereign God of the universe. And these writers have continued in the same vein of the Pauline epistles where there is this sense of wonder for God, I am so grateful for your mercy, for your grace, and for your patience. And I think you and I would have to admit that there have been seasons in our walk where we have tried the patience of God, but God has been long-suffering with us. But why has God shown patience 
to the Apostle Paul. And why does he show patience to us? And I believe that God does that as a sort of pattern, as a, as a sort of sketch to those that have not yet come into God's kindness. When they look at you, when they look at me, and they know us, they know our history, they know where we've come from, and they see where we are today, that God was patient with us. Even though we were liars and thieves and though we were promiscuous, though we were involved deeply in homosexuality or maybe even witchcraft, that God was patient with us and he's pulled us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves and started that long road of sanctification in our lives. And through it all, he never casts us away. When those outside of God's covenant see that, it provokes a wonder in them for, for who is this great God? This God that extends great mercy. This God that pours out his grace upon undeserving people. This God that extends mercy towards those that are so undeserving. Who is this God? And we can proclaim boldly that this is the God that saves through his son, Jesus Christ. If you consider everything that I've said thus far, that there's one more point that needs to be made that we see consistent in Paul and in his writings, that gratitude is the ground on which humility walks, that humility walks upon, not arrogance. Uh, there's no way that we can say that everything that we have has been given to us by God for God to push back what is dark in the world that I have not pulled myself up by my own bootstraps that to God be all the glory. You cannot say those things and walk with a swag. Paul's life can be characterized by three things and these are the three things that characterize my life as well. God's grace, God's mercy, and God's unlimited patience. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 9th through the 11th verse, and I want to read this. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, the 10th verse. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Yes, there's some hard work we do. We we go about to expand and to extend God's kingdom within the church arena and also in secular society. But please realize that everything that you have been able to accomplish, it has been because of the grace of the sovereign God of the universe. It has been because of God's mercy. It has been because God has been patient with us. And that should result in humility in us because of who we were, because of what we have done, and because of what we have received by virtue of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Genuine humility grew in the life of the Apostle Paul because he was Christ-centered. Grace produces in us Christ-centeredness. Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, listen, I press towards the mark of the high calling. He says, I'm trying to apprehend that which has apprehended me. And, and so that's what grace produces in us, a pursuit of Christ. Whereas the effect of sin in anybody's life is self-centered. You, you cannot see beyond yourself. And see, here we have the Apostle Paul who's given us the perfect testimony as it relates to what happens in the life of an individual that has experienced the mercy of God, has experienced the grace of God, and has experienced the, the long-suffering or the patience of God. It creates in them a wonder for God, a, a it creates in them a deep, rich gratitude, and it also brings about in their life humility. There are two marks I need to uh, make mention of here in Paul's testimony. Mark number one is that Paul in his testimony brings no glory to himself. He only mentions his life before Christ, his depravity, uh, to show you how messed up he was, uh, but also to show you how great God's mercy is, how extensive it is, how extensive the grace of God is, and how patient God has been with him. The second mark of 
Paul's testimony is that he gives all the glory to the sovereign God of the universe. And we see that in the 17th verse, which is our doxology. All of this, everything that I've preached th thus far, everything that I've shared thus far brings us to this point. He's overflowing with joy. And he says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And this eternal king, he's speaking of God. He said, God, you're the one who rules. You're the one who reigns. You have complete power. You have complete authority. The immortal God, you existed before every single thing. You were before all things. You're going to be here at the end when everything else is gone. And he says, you are the creator of all things and you are the sustainer of everything that exists. The invisible God. What he's saying here is that God is invisible. In other words, we will never know everything that there is to know about God. There is this mystery. There is this creator, creation distinction. And there's a barrier there that you and I will never cross. And so God has revealed himself to us, but we will never know everything that there is to know about this invisible God. And he says that he alone is wise. So God, you alone are wise. God, I trust your wisdom. I know what I used to be. I know the damage that I did to the church prior to my confrontation with you on the Damascus Road. But God, now I see your wisdom in that. I see your wisdom in that. And you are the all-wise God. And let me tell you something about you personally. There are some things that you have been through and you can't figure out why you had to go through the things you went through. But let me tell you something. You can trust God's wisdom that there was a redemptive purpose in that. That God is the all wise God who does all things well. And lastly, he says, be honor and glory forever and ever. Now, Paul said, knowing all this, I just can't stop praising God. I just can't stop praising God. And I pray for you today as you have listened through Paul's testimony and the things I've shared with you today, I pray that it has resulted in a bubbling over of your soul, of your spirit this morning, and that you just won't be able to cease proclaiming the goodness, the mercy, the grace, the patience of the sovereign God of the universe, because that is what causes the nations to rejoice. They need to know that there's a God out there. No matter how low you are, no matter what you have done, there's a God out there that can take you from the guttermost and place you in the heavenly places with his son, Jesus Christ. So God bless you and I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Can I pray with you? Bow your heads. Father, I pray today, Lord, that we will begin to reflect upon your grace and your mercy and your patience towards us personally, Lord. And I pray that a doxological statement would go forth, a doxology, Lord, would spring from our souls as we declare your goodness to the nations, Lord. The nations, Lord, they need to hear. They want to hear good news. There's bad news everywhere. Does anybody have any good news? And we ought to have good news today that we serve a God that still extends mercy, that is still gracious, and that he exhibits perfect patience even to those that are struggling today. So, Father, we give you glory, we give you praise, exalt yourself in us and through us for the praise and exaltation of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. God bless you, and we're going to ask you to prepare with us to share the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you. 
that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it and he gave to them and said, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. Let's eat the body. After the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had sub said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the blood and body of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for another privilege and opportunity to share the communion. And we ask your blessing upon each and every one who has participated today. In Jesus' name, amen. So divine Demands my soul My life My all Thank you so much for joining our virtual service today. We'd like to close with a doxology found in Colossians chapter 3 verses 15 through 17 and it reads and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let us pray. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. We bless you in the name of Jesus. See you next week.